Okay, going live uh, on to uh, love addiction. If you're love addicted to someone, or if you, um, oh, thank you. If you're love addicted to someone, um, and there is, um, <clears throat> and the question then is to text or not to text if you're love addicted. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> to be or not to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so now one one of the things um, and the idea of uh, do you lose your power if you text or if you don't text, you know, if you're love addicted to someone. Okay, so one of the things that really, really helped me was um, and I heard this from one of my teachers, Muji. Uh, and um, so the thing is, um, if you, if you, if you, um, if the ego projects specialness onto anything, you know, uh, the ego can project specialness onto a romantic partner. Like mm -hmm. that woman is very special. She's the per she's the woman who'll fix me, make me whole. Um, or it can project it onto anything, you know, it can project it onto drugs, onto donuts, onto a car, onto a career, onto a job. So when, when, it, when the ego has projected this specialness or this magicalness onto anything, a person, place, or situation, so what happens is that as soon as you, um, uh, so it's like actually what's happening is as soon as you uh, so you have this thing, when I get the person, when the person says they love me and they're going to be there faithfully for me forever, you know, when I get that thing, then, uh, so the ego has this thing, it projects this specialness out there, and then if, if you get that, let's say, you know, you're hoping that they're going to say, look, I love you and I'm going to be with you forever, I'll never abandon you, and you get, that, you get the thing that you're looking for, that the ego's projecting out there, then what happens is then, see, uh, the ego then goes into a state of silence because it's got the thing it's always been wanting. And what happens when the ego goes very, very quiet, it's like the ego deflates. It's got the thing it always wanted its whole life. And then you get this huge high. You feel this ecstasy rush, this happiness. You feel you're one with God, one with life, one with this person. All your dreams have come true. You know, fireworks everywhere. And, and then... And then what happens is then, after a short period of time of this oneness, this love, this joy, this uh, bliss, is then a thought emerges that it's not enough, and that you need it slightly different, or you need it, you know, they need to say something else, or, or whatever. So what, what it was, you know, Muji was explaining this, and he was referring to mana, I believe, was that when you want something, you're actually in a state of ego distress because you're constantly having a thought in your, you could say, in your unconscious or your conscious mind that I can only be happy until I get this thing. I'll only be happy when they propose, you know. I'll only be happy when they, say, you know, they give me a ring or something. So when you get that, so really, when you're wanting something, you're in a state of ego distress. You're in a state of actual suffering because you haven't got the thing you want. So when you get the thing that you want, your ego stays silent, plays dead, just plays dead like a dog, you know, just plays dead, just stays quiet. And then you feel this high. And that high doesn't actually come from the marriage proposal. It's from the absence of the ego, because the ego is quiet for a little while. And then the ego projects out that the happiness came from the proposal, from the person. So then ascribes, yes, it's true. I wanted this person to propose to me. I got the proposal and I'm happy. So that means my notion is correct, that this person can give me happiness. And then later it starts chatting that you need more. And so the person needs to give you more or change or be different. So really, any time you want something, you're in a state of suffering. And when you get the thing you want, you get, your ego shuts up and plays dead and you get a high. But that high doesn't actually come from the object you think is giving you the high. It's coming from the absence of your ego wanting the thing. And then later on, it, it doesn't stay quiet for very long before it wants more. So, mm -hmm. recognizing that, then I thought, well, to want something and then to get it and then get a high from it because I wanted it is an illusion. 
you know, it's like if I was to obsess about donuts for the whole day and then I eat a donut and I get a high, it's not the donut that's made me high, it's that the absence of my distress for not eating donuts and then eating the donut my ego stays quiet and then I get a spiritual connection from God. So the solution then my ego says is to eat more donuts. But actually I don't need more donuts, I just need to, if you like, transcend this craving for donuts and the thoughts for donuts. And then I'll be in a constant high without having going through this illusory trap, going after donut after donut, trying to be, trying to be happy to make me whole. So um, once I realized that, I realized that everything I chase or imbue with magical properties or special qualities is actually going to put me in a trap of being in distress. And when I get it, I'll get a high, which can, if I'm not careful, be an addictive cycle where I think the thing gives me a high, but the thing has no power to give me a high. Now, so, so what then makes me whole and complete is my connection, is being in the observer, or being in the now, or being in the eternal now. That's what makes me complete and whole. So the minute I, um, now if, in a, if I'm in love addiction, then I've projected specialness onto a woman. So if I then, uh, if I then identify with a thought, or I put, pick up the phone, or I start texting the woman, to try and feel more whole, and I've projected specialness on her, I will start to lose my sense of wholeness, and I'll go down an addictive route of wanting more, wanting more text to respond, wanting more affirmation from the woman, because, um, uh, because the more I do it, the more my ego will ask to try and get a bit more of a hit, which is an illusion to eventually stop working. So it's just an illusion. So. Now, does this mean to never text? I would say it's okay to text once you've transcended. After you've transcended and made the person non-special, or you've felt out the craving energy. If, you sit, if I sit with the craving energy, I have to call her now. I have to, when, I, when I get this craving energy that I have to do it now, that means I have to not do it now. Because when the craving energy to do it now, I have to eat the donut now, I have to text now, then that's the time where I have to sit and not, not act on the craving. Because to act on the craving will mean a loss of, of, of my connection to God, to the observer, to the, to the eternal now. So it's to sit through and feel that out or go to the observer of the craving until it's completely gone and then I'm in the oneness of the eternal now and the observer. And then you could say, you could possibly then write a text when she's meaningless and when you're in the infinite. But to make a, a text when you're feeling the craving and wanting the affirmation will then reinforce the ego and, uh, and the bondage and the addiction to do it in that place of in the ego, in the craving, in the thoughts, wanting the thing. That will make the situation worse. So if, you are, if you use it as an opportunity, I, I need to text her now, I've got the craving to text her now, don't do that, feel it out, go to the observer and she means nothing, and there's no craving. And then it doesn't matter whether you text or not, it doesn't matter. But actually, that's, a, that's texting from power. And, and actually, there's limited harm that can happen when you text from power. We're on camera, but if you want to speak on camera... You can, can I speak. ask a question? Yeah, on camera, yeah. Well, my question, my situation with the text today was that I, I did feel tremendously em empowered when I sent the text. I did okay. feel that... He had become meaningless, okay. and I was on. I was feeling a natural sort of high, and I got over all of that. What you said, um, but as you were speaking just now, and I and realizing I hadn't sent the text from that place of craving. I had sent it from a very strong, seemingly strong place. Hmm. As you were talking just now, it reminded me in the book, the Alcoholics Anonymous book. Yeah. There's a story, there are stories about how cunning, baffling, and powerful the addiction can be, mm -hmm. where a person might get the impulse to drink even after having been sober for some time and feeling very whole and feeling excellent not having been drinking, and then they suddenly get the impulse, perhaps, um, again, this is in the book, the, the, you know, yeah. they suddenly walk into a bar and they think, I'm feeling wonderful, what harm could it do to mm -hmm. possibly have a drink? This is an alcoholic who's yeah. obviously addicted. Mm -hmm. um, but in that moment, when I sent that text, I thought, what harm could this do? And it was only after I sent it 
and after that alcoholic has that drink, they realize what have I done? And mm. uh, and I think that's mm. that's the cunning, baffling, and powerful element of the addiction itself. We don't think clearly sometimes when we are addicts. Mm. That that was my experience today. Mm. I think uh, I think uh, I think that uh, thank you for saying that. I think sometimes there can be no craving, mm. but there can be a cunning thought. And that's true, mm. and uh, so. Mm. That can happen when there's still the projection of specialness, mm. even though there's no addictive craving. If the person is yeah. projected with magical mm. qualities, yes. then cunning thoughts will arise. Like, cunning mm. thoughts don't come mm. to me like, let me steal Demetrius Plant. Mm. Am I allowed to say that on there? Okay. So, because it's not special. <laughs> it's not special. So I won't get cunning thoughts about something which I haven't projected specialness onto. But I will get, uh, like, uh, like, I might get a thought of, um, you know, like, uh, what could I get? Like, how can I steal all the biscuits in this place, you know? So, I might, I might not be in a craving for a biscuit, but I might get, a, if the biscuits are still magical, then I might suddenly, a thought might pop out of nowhere saying, well, it would be good, you know, probably, you know, probably it's good yeah. to, people probably uh, should be, kept away from biscuits, they're probably like an evil in the world, so if I just take all the biscuits away, that will be good for everybody, I'll be doing everyone a favour. So yeah. yes, that's true, and I think, so even though the craving has been transcended, yeah. I think as still if something is projected with magicalness, yeah. um, then cunning thoughts will arise. Yeah. So then, you know, the Course in Miracles thing of like, okay, the biscuit is as meaningless as the table, or, um, or this attractive woman is as meaningless as the plant, which is as meaningless as the banana, which is as meaningless <laughs> as, as the light bulb. So if you do that, then the cunning, th cunning thoughts don't come for, for meaningless objects, but will come for things that still have that special glamour uh, associated with them. So that's a great question. Thank you for letting me know.